Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Trinity. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. That you're here to join us in our worship time. Most everybody has one of these, I think, these days. It's my cell phone. And uh, one of the ways that I like to use it is I've got an app on here, uh, K-Love. I'm a K-Love fan. You probably heard of K-Love radio station, and I'm a K-Love fan, and I got an app on here, so no matter where I am, I can get K-Love, and I can plug these little earbuds in, and I can listen to worship music, and it actually sort of becomes like a private time of worship for me. A lot of times if I'm mowing or if I'm in the tractor, and as important as that is that you worship privately, what we're about to do together is just as important, if not more important. So I just want to share just a few reasons this morning why God thinks that corporate worship is important. And you'll find throughout Scripture examples of corporate worship. First of all, it reminds us that our Father, when we say our Father who art in heaven, is just that. He's our Father. He's not just my Father. He's not just your Father, but He's our Father. And corporate worship is a good reminder that we all love and serve the same God. We're not an only child, even though sometimes I'd like to be, but we're not. Secondly, there are things that happen in a corporate setting that won't happen privately or anywhere else. God moves, a lot of times you see in the New Testament and Old Testament that God moved in ways when his people were gathered that never happened anywhere else. And thirdly, public worship is designed to be an encouragement so we can encourage those believers that we are with, that are around us. God wants you to express your worship in a way that is encouraging to those around you. And lastly, he's waiting on it. Right now, at this moment, he is seated on the throne and he is awaiting those whose hearts are fully devoted to him, looking for those people who will open up their hearts and their souls and their mouths and worship him. I liken it to when the head of the household calls the family for dinner. And I know my mom, she didn't even care if we weren't hungry. She wanted us at the table because it was dinner time. So out of respect, even if we weren't hungry, we sat there. Even if we didn't eat, we were there. And I think God is much the same way. He expects us to come. So out of respect for him, we come together to worship him together. So will you join me in a word of prayer this morning as we start our worship time? Lord, we just thank you that you are a God that loves us. We thank you and recognize you as creator of the universe and all that is. We recognize, Lord, that you are in control of everything. And we open our hearts to you, Lord. We open our souls to you. And we lift up our voices together, Lord, as we praise you this morning. Will you stand with me, please? Lord, prepare.
Someone next to you, give them a fist bump and tell them you're glad to see them this morning. You guys are awesome. I'm just saying. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Trinity. I'm going to ask up there on the computer if you can go back to my slide for me that says you would, if you would lay down your life that we would be set free. Can you put that slide back up for me? The words of the song that we just sang. If, if, if there's no other good news that you receive today, that is it. That is the best news we could receive. You would lay down your life that I would be set free. A few weeks ago when Chad talked up here and we all wrote down on our paper what our rock was in our life, more than half of those rocks contained the word fear. Fear. But we know now we don't have to have that fear. We don't have to live in fear because he did lay down his life and we have been set free. The tomb was as empty today as it was on Resurrection Sunday. And that is great and exciting news, and that's news to get, just to get pumped up about. So let's go to God real quick in a word of prayer. Father, I love you so much. You are such an awesome God. And Father, that you would, that your love for us would be unending, it would be undying, it would be unconditional. There's nothing we can do to lose it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's the same today as it was yesterday, as it will be tomorrow and forevermore. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fear anything because I have you. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your willingness to see beyond that cross to the glory that lay behind it. To, that what lay beyond that was a life forever spent with you through a relationship with you. No fear, no pain, no regrets. Father, we love you so much and we praise you and we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to say a quick welcome. If you are a guest with us today, special welcome to you. My name is Steve, and it's my honor to be on staff here at Trinity. And I just want to say, if you as a guest would take the tear-off part of the bulletin and fill it out, that helps us get to know you a little bit better. You can drop in the offering plate here in a minute or take it out to the Welcome Center. Also on that tear-off sheet is where all of y'all can put your prayer requests. Write down anything at all that's on your heart and know that us as a staff and as our prayer team, we will pray over those with you this week because the things that are on your heart is what we want to be on our heart also. So you can drop those in the offering plate, you can bring them up, lay them on the altar, hand it to us, turn them into the office, get them to us somehow, so that we as a group are praying together for the things that are on your heart. A couple of real quick things to share with you. If you are a small group leader, or if you've ever been a small group leader, or if you think there's ever a chance that you wanna be a small group leader, there is a, a training session, a, a recognition session back in the Student Life Center from one to three o'clock today, all right? You are invited to attend that. Please make sure that you do so. Rumor has it Mark's homemade ice cream is gonna make an appearance back there. So for nothing else, that's motivation to be a small group leader. Also, we wanna say a great thank you and welcome home to our high school missions team. They have arrived home safely. A big thank you to all of you for your prayers, for your support, and we're looking forward in the weeks to come to hearing about how their lives have been changed and how God has used them to change the life of others. As always, if you get the opportunity, read your bulletin, check the featured ministry table out, and see the places where God has to connect you to this church and to his will. With that, we're going to continue in our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you are a guest, again, your gift to us today is, is being here. We thank you so much. You don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the offering plate. For those of you who are regular attenders, thank you. Thank you for your support 
of the work that God does through this church because of your heart. So with that, the ushers are going to take up the offering and the worship team is going to sing for us.
spirit of the living God We only wanna hear your voice We're hanging on every It is a good and right thing to give God our praise, and so as we worship him this morning, we worship him in anticipation of what he says to us. And what he says to you might not come through me. My name is Jim Stauffer, and I'm going to give the message today, and I'm on staff here at the church as well, but uh, it might be that God speaks to you in the midst of the singing and the music. It might be that in the midst of the prayers or the fellowship or uh, time before or after our, our formal service, it might be that as we open the word and hear from him today that he has a word for you, but somewhere in the midst of that, we expect that God is speaking. And that's a sense of anticipation that all of us have to bring to our worship. That's a sense of responsibility that as you come this morning, you say, God, I expect to hear from you. And so uh, as we sing that song, boy, it's an amazing thing to think about what God can do. And it is overwhelming for me to think that I would do it by myself. And so as we prepare to open his word, let's go together to the Lord in prayer. And so God, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts right now. Lord, I thank you for those who've been prepared by being on a mission trip and by serving in, in places that we can't even imagine here in our community. Lord, we thank you for those who went to vacation Bible school two weeks ago and for the way you continue to work in their lives. God, we praise you as a congregation together this morning. And ask that in the midst of all that happens, that our hearts might be prepared to hear what you have to say to us. For we give it all to you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Uh, we are continuing a worship series on worship, uh, a sermon series on worship this morning. So you can pull out your sermon notes if you'd like. Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, we'll encourage you to follow along uh, as well this morning. So uh, we're going to start off in the Gospel of Luke. Before we get there, I want to encourage you, uh, in the middle of your bulletins, again this week, is a little uh, plug for Right Now Media. Uh, right Now Media is a uh, electronic subscription service, and the church has already paid for the subscription. So it is free for you. You will not have to pay to watch anything on uh, Right Now Media. If you want, you can, you know, ask for the books or uh, some of the things they'll offer to pay, offer to let you pay for, but you don't have to pay for anything. It is totally free. So you should have received an email about it already, uh, maybe a couple of them. If you have not received an email from us, it's because either A, you don't check your email, that could be the ha what's happening, or B, we don't have your email. And so if we don't have your email, just to write that down for us or give us a call or an email this week, we will send you an invitation. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you don't know what to watch, you can start with a Bible study called Gospel-Shaped Worship, and uh, it goes along with our sermon series here. You can check that out. There's also another conference session from uh, one of their Right Now sessions called Learning to Worship in the Dark, and uh, it's a conference session, a one-time talk about how you worship when things are difficult. And so maybe those are helpful to you this week. Maybe you give up a, an episode on Netflix or uh, whatever else you're watching. Give up some Facebook time and check out those this week and help your worship grow deeper. Uh, this morning we're going uh, again to Luke chapter 19. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there or we'll have it on the screen as well this morning. It says, When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives... The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Uh, we enter into that passage again, thinking about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And the disciples are worshiping him, and they're waving palms and putting down their cloaks in front of Jesus. And uh, they are worshiping him with such intensity and in preparation to go into Jerusalem that the Pharisees, the leaders of the religion of the day, wanted Jesus to settle the people down. 
This is at the end of three years of ministry. Jesus has been with his disciples now for three years. He's been in public ministry for three years. And so what they don't realize now is Jesus is almost at the very end of his ministry. Uh, this, this week, in fact, this Sunday is a Sunday when a lot of United Methodist pastors are starting a new church, right? Almost every moving van you saw this last week was a Methodist pastor getting moved, right? Or a Jewish rabbi. Jewish rabbis and Methodist preachers all move in the last two weeks of Ju- June. It's true. That's absolutely true. And so if you don't want to move, don't ever move during this last week of June, right? Uh, Jesus only had three years with the church, Right? At this point, I'm blessed to begin another new conference year with you. This year, uh, I believe, marks my uh, eighth year here as pastor, which means I've had more than twice as long as Jesus did, and you still haven't killed me. <laughs> Must be doing something right or wrong, I don't know. After three years, they killed Jesus. That's not quite the model that most of us want to follow. And yet, Jesus knows at the end of three years, he is coming to the climax of his ministry, and his disciples have grown from being fishermen and tax collectors to being the kind of men and then women who would spread the gospel to the whole world. Jesus expected growth in his followers. And this morning, as we talk about worship, I want to challenge you with this thought, and that is that worship causes spiritual growth. When we worship rightly, when when Kyle talks this morning and we sing together, it should cause us to say, God, as I get into your presence, it is causing me to grow. There should also be some of you here today who say, you know what? I I have been in missions this week. I have been serving God. I have seen God move in my life. And so I'm coming to worship this morning as a result of what I've seen God do. I don't need, I don't need God to grow me. I need to give God praise because I've grown in this last week together. Worship might cause your spiritual growth today. Uh, worship might result in your spiritual growth today. I don't know how it is that worship is going to cause or result in your growth, but I know that growth should ultimately happen. Now, what should worship be doing in you right now? Should it cause growth or should it result in growth? Let me tell you this, that's like asking about the chicken and the egg. I don't know. I don't know if worship is the result or the cause of your growth today, but I know that if you are worshiping, God's intention for that is for you to grow. I was with some uh, farmers this week. We were traveling, traveling with farmers and looking at the fields. It's amazing how interested farmers are in fields. Right? If, if they're, even if they're the one driving, they're staring at all the fields. And so if the dumb preacher says, well, look at that field, they can tell you who planted that field and when that field was planted and what used to be in that field and how much that field should produce and how much rain the other fields got and what's going on in the north of the county, west of the county, east of the county, south of the county. I learned more about farming in one half an hour truck trip than I've learned in my whole life. <laughs> right? Because it's amazing how much there is to know about what you grow. I said, wow, look at, you know, look at all those, look at all those soybeans, yep. Look at all that corn, yep. I said, how about the wheat? Do we grow any wheat? We don't grow much wheat around here. It gets, it gets all sorts of diseases. I said, well, that's too bad because I really, you know, I like things you make with wheat. I like, I like Special K and I like Wheaties and I like bread. They're like, that's not the kind of wheat we grow. I said, what do you mean that's not the kind of wheat we grow? They said, we don't grow wheat for bread in this area. Any of the wheat you see, this soft Red winter wheat, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that, right? This soft red winter wheat, we don't use that for bread. You're not helping us out when you eat bread. You don't need to eat cereal. I said, well, what do you do with all this soft red winter wheat that we grow? They said, we make donuts. (laughs) That means eating donuts helps our economy. I authorize you to eat all the donuts you want. And your farmers thank you. (laughs) Right? When you grow things, you care about what you grow. When farmers look at fields, they're not just passively, mildly interested in what's going on. They are intensely passionate about what's supposed to happen in that field. When we talk about the gospel in the church, when we talk about the seeds that God plants in us, when we talk about the expectation of spiritual growth, Worship is not something that we casually say, oh, isn't that nice? It's something that we take passionate interest in because God expects something to happen in the midst of it. 
So this morning, I want to talk about what worship can and is doing in our growth together. Now, in your bulletin notes, when I wrote them earlier this week, I was going for kind of an either-or kind of sermon. But the longer I spent with the sermon this week, the more I thought this is not an either-or sermon. This is a sermon about growing from one place to where it is that God intends us to be. So as, as you look at your sermon notes, feel free to correct them because they're wrong, right? I want to talk about what's, what worship moves us from and how we grow into what it's supposed to be. It's not either or, but true worship grows us from being people who just worship because we're getting something from God to being people who are worshiping because we're giving something to God. When you start out as a worshiper, it should not be unusual to us that we start in a place that you say, God, I need to get something from you. I need to get something. I need to get forgiveness. I need to get assurance. I need to get something. I need to pray for my children. I need to pray for my marriage. I need to pray for safe travels, right? Two weeks ago, we prayed for Beulah Beach. Last week, we prayed for our young folks who were headed out on their mission trip. And we prayed all sorts of prayers that said, God, we need to get you to give us protection, to give them safety, to bring them home. Now it's two weeks later, and praise God, all of those prayers have been answered. We did not lose one kid at Vacation Bible School. As far as I know, our entire youth group came home. Yeah, woo! Now, because God answered prayers that we can see physically, it should not surprise us that we would believe that God answers our prayers spiritually. Because not only did we pray for our children to get home safely, not only did we pray for our youth to get home safely, we prayed that God, your Holy Spirit, would work in their lives to plant a seed of the gospel. You would grow them in their willingness to see what you are doing. And so this morning, not only do we say, God, thank you, but we say, God, you're doing something we can't fully see. And so we come to give God thanks. We worship and God speaks to our hearts about what it is we can give to him. In Psalm 136, uh, the psalmist is talking about who God is and the result of knowing God. Uh, By the way, the disciples in Luke 19 are, are sharing psalms about the Messiah. Somehow following Jesus results in us learning the word, knowing what the word says. In Psalm 136, it begins and says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And then it goes through a whole set of verses about the glory that God gives to us. Listen, in the last two or three weeks, I have never seen as many rainbows in my entire life as I've seen the last three weeks. I have never seen sun shoot up through the clouds, not down through the clouds, but last night it was shooting up through the clouds across, across my backyard. It was amazing. When we pay attention to what God is doing, who created all things, it's not just what we get, it's what we want to give back. The psalmist writes about all of nature that is giving God praise. And in the very last verse of Psalm 136, it says, give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. When we are truly worshiping, it moves us from being people who just come to God to get something to being people who say, God, I want to give you something. It moves us from being people who are just worried about what we're singing to being people who are willing to say, God, I surrender to your will. Right? One of the biggest mistakes we make about worship is when we start worshiping, we start worshiping and think that it's about the music that we sing. We think worship generally is about how well we're singing. Singing by itself is not worship. Singing causes us to worship. But too often we get stuck, we never grow. And if you're only looking for churches that sing the songs that you like, then you will find yourself disappointed over and over and over again. We try to, we try to do good songs, Bryce, Right? Every week is working hard in our worship ministry. I, I found a little, a little internet uh, expertise here about it. It's, it's entitled The Perfect Worship Service, so I'd like to read it to you. These are, uh, these are directions we're now using in planning our service. It says, your services should be longer and get done early. It says, you should sing more of those wonderful, lovely old hymns and less of those stupid, dead old hymns. It says songs should flow quickly between, from one to the other, 
And you should have long periods of time between the songs for reflection. It says you should have more lovely arrangements with extra instruments and less of those showy arrangements with all those extra instruments. It says you should repeat songs over and over again so that people learn them, and you should not repeat songs because they get boring. It says all songs should be sung in higher and lower keys. It says the band should play in the middle of the platform where they can be seen, behind the plants where they won't be a distraction. They should play louder and softer and faster and slower and more often and not at all. As long as we do all that, we have the perfect worship service. Right? If singing is all that worship is, then we get stuck in our spiritual growth. If singing is all that we can imagine worship to be, then we limit God in what he's doing to us. Once you learn to sing well in worship, you free yourself up to say, God, it's not, it's not about the singing. It's about my willingness to surrender to you. Truly singing in worship is an act of surrender. It's singing the words that we're all going to sing together. It's singing the notes that we've all chosen to sing together. It's singing in, in the rhythm that all of us are going to sing together. It is an act of worship when we surrender our own willingness to do whatever we want to do and simply say, God, I'm going to surrender so that I can be a part of the voices that are being lifted up for you. But that's not easy. It is not easy for us to surrender. And yet Jesus expected his disciples to grasp that message. As Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, it is the moment of greatest surrender of all of the cosmos. As people worship Jesus, Jesus understood that he was about to surrender himself to the will of his Father. He was about to go to the cross. Jesus, in part, isn't simply letting people worship because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is letting people worship because he knows what they're doing. Jesus receives your worship today, not because you understand what God is about to do, but because he knows he's about to do something in your life. And so part of our worship is a willingness to surrender to what God is doing. I don't, I don't have a, a large field. I am not a farmer. I've got a, a little bit of flower bed at my house, right? Do you know what I have never planted in the flower beds of my house? Weeds. Never once. I have never planted weeds. In fact, as far as I can tell, they don't sell weeds at the store. That would be stupid. Because you don't have to do anything to get weeds. Weeds just grow. I turn my back, I come back the next day, and there are weeds. I have a couple of options with my flower bed at this point. I could continue to get down on my hands and knees and ask my wife, is this a weed? Is this a weed? Is this a weed? and pull out the ones that she says are weeds. Or, here's the other thing I think I'm gonna go for, I'm just gonna call them all flowers. I'm just gonna let it grow no matter what's in there and they'll all get huge and beautiful and produce lots of more lovely weeds and I'll invite you to come see them. And I can say, look how good I can grow my flowers. And you might say, pastor, those are weeds. And I'll say, please don't hurt my feelings. Now, Jesus often talks about our soul as a place where he plants the word and where the enemy often puts in weeds. You have weeds in your soul. It's not, it's not like you went looking for pride and ego and anger and jealousy and lust this week. Nobody came into my office and said, you know what, I'd like you to counsel me this week, Pastor, because I'm really, I'm not angry enough. <laughs> but you've got it. You've got it this week. You've got ego and pride and lust and frustration and anger. You've got bitterness and envy. And the question is, are you going to say, God, I am going to get before you once again this week, and I'm going to say, God, is this a weed? Is that a weed? Is this a weed? Or am I just going to say, you know what? <sighs> Look at the rest of the world. They just let it all grow. They just have beautiful weed gardens. And the church comes along and says, those are weeds. They say, don't hurt my feelings. Don't tell me I have to get rid of any of that. Don't tell me I have to change. 
Jesus talking to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew is explaining to them what it is that he's going to do. He explains directly to them what's about to happen as he goes to Jerusalem. And Peter, who has just claimed to know Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, tells Jesus, he looks at him and began to rebuke Jesus, never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me will find it. And Jesus goes on to teach about the cost of following him. And if you're here this morning and you want to be a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to read this passage in these verses. And when we worship, I want to ask you, is worship an exercise of surrender for you? Is worship an exercise of surrender? Do you come willing to say, God, show me how I can serve? Now, here's one of the tough things about, about worship. One of the reasons we're teaching about worship is because it's not something we do naturally. In this culture, in our world, we are taught to find the things that we want that make us feel good, that serve us. And it is true that oftentimes when we come to worship, we come in order to find out how well does the church meet that cultural expectation. Who's going to serve me? How is this going to entertain me? But as you grow in Christ, I challenge you to say we have to grow past those sinful expectations and say, God, what am I here to give? And how am I here to serve? And how do I surrender to what you're doing? All of you in this room are authorized to recognize the word of God, the voice of God in your life. Right? We are not often, we are not often in this church, in this service in particular, the folks who care most about making sure everything is perfectly organized, right? That's just not who we are. It's not our culture. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But that's because the expectation is not that, not that somehow a human has to tell you what you're supposed to do, but rather as people following God, we listen to where the Spirit calls. Some of you are gifted with hospitality. Listen, if you're gifted with hospitality and you walk in and you're like, well, nobody's greeting at the door. You are authorized to greet people at the door. Everybody in this room. The bulletins are kept right there beside the door. You hold one and you stand at the door and you smile at people. Right? If that doesn't come naturally to you, then if you choose to be a greeter, smile anyway. <laughs> and if your spiritual gift is grumpiness, just come sit down. <laughs> right? At the end of most services here at 1115, we ask you to help us stack chairs. Because we don't have a chair stacking team. Now, this week we don't have to stack chairs. Woohoo! That always makes me happy, right? B but most Sundays we do, and the next week we've got to find people who will unstack chairs. If your spiritual gift is unstacking chairs, we would love to find a team or two more of people who are willing to unstack chairs. Because some of our chair stacking teams have done it for 15 years. And I know that there's a new generation of chair unstackers being raised up. It doesn't sound very spiritual, but if, if you want to say, God, how do I surrender? I authorize you to help one another in worship. Right? If somebody needs help, I am authorizing all of you in this room. There is nobody exempt from your ability to walk across the aisle or around the set of chairs and to find somebody and say, is there, is there something I can do for you? Do you need some help because all of us have to find our willingness to say God you've called me here for a reason and it might not be for what I can get get it might be for what I can give worship can be an exercise of our surrender and true worship grows us from being just about the people we're with to being actually recognizing that we're in the presence of God Listen, nobody comes to a church without knowing there's going to be people there. Nobody showed up here today and said, well, I hope it's just me, right? All of you came today and said, you know what, I'm going to come and there are going to be people there and I know that. Some people are waiting 
for an invitation. The reason most people come to church is because some other person invites them. I would never have gone to church in college had Bill Canarosi not invited me to go with him on a Sunday. Had Bill not sat there beside me in church and afterwards said, you know what, I'm glad you're here. Why don't you come back with me next week? People is one of the reasons we worship. It's one of the reasons you choose the church you choose to go to. You look for people you know and family and friends. I went to church when I was young because my parents brought me. I went to church as a teenager because my parents made me. I go to church as I get older to be with my family and friends that I want to be. At 8.30 service today, Jane Hoover was here. For those of you who are long uh, time parts of the church, you'll know that Jane has had a long battle with cancer. Jane came today and nobody's going to remember my sermon. They didn't care what I had to say. They just all wanted to go see Jane. People are part of the reason we worship. When we get to heaven, it is going to be full of people. So don't think that worship is somehow not about people, but it's not just about the people. Because your worship has to move you from caring about just what the people say about you or around you to recognizing that our worship moves us together to be in the presence of God. In the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, Moses has led the people out of Egypt. In Exodus 33, God has a word for his people. In verses 1, 2, and 3, if you've got your Bibles, in Exodus 33, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. Go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Pezzarites, Hevites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But... I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Whew. God says, listen, you can go. You can have it. I will send an angel before you. But God says, I am not going with you because you are so far away from me. You are so unaware of what I'm doing that if I went with you, I would destroy you. That's the God that we come to worship on Sunday mornings. Kind of makes you take worship a little bit more serious. And Moses then intercedes. Moses steps in to have a conversation with God. Just like Jesus does in the New Testament for all humanity, Moses steps in to have a conversation with God and pleads with God that he would go with them. In verse 15 and 16, we get this snippet of the conversation. Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people and all the, uh, from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses knew it was no good for God's people to go to the promised land unless God went with them. It does us no good to build our buildings or sing our songs or do our programs or print our bulletins unless we know in the midst of all those things that we are in the presence of the very God himself who made us, who loved us, who receives our worship. When we come on Sunday mornings to worship, there should be a sense in which we recognize that God's presence is why we're here. That the Holy Spirit has full right and reign to speak into our hearts and lives, to change us from what we are in our sinfulness and in our brokenness to what He desires us to be. True worship is not easy. Like weeds in the garden, we get things into our souls all the time that block us out from what worship is supposed to be. But Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we are called to gather together and worship God because over Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, it changes us. Last service, John sat right here in the front row. John now has a feeding tube. He's going up to Chicago for chemotherapy treatments five days a week for five weeks now, there's some of you who've been a part of weddings right here this week on Wednesday we're going to do Steve Kiefer's memorial service right here 
in the midst of living life, we discover that we are called to worship together because worship allows God to be at work in our hearts. It allows us to share all of who we are with Him. If any of this sounds familiar, it's because a lot of it comes from a book we read last year in our leadership called Vertical Church by Jim McDonald. If you don't have that book or you'd like to read it, we've got copies in the library. Ultimately, worship moves us from being people who are just about feelings to being people who recognize that our feelings move us to be people of faith. Worship is not simply about the emotions you experience, but just like singing, it's not that emotions are bad. It's the fact that emotions are given to us to move us to become people who trust God. In the midst of all of the ways that we worship, we become people who recognize God in the midst of our tears, in the midst of our joy, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our, in the midst of our victories. Jesus meets with a woman at the well in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. This woman has been ostracized, perhaps. She's there at the well in the middle of the day, which would be unusual. And Jesus comes to meet with her and talk to her, and we discover in that conversation perhaps why nobody else would be there with her. Jesus tells the woman that she's had five husbands, and the man that she's living with right now was not her husband. But Jesus comes to offer her a word of encouragement and invitation. She wants to know about how they should worship. There is no person that God has made that is exempt from the desire to say, God, I'm made for something bigger than this. That my life is more than just these years that I get here. That in the midst of my challenges and my victories, I'm looking for a greater purpose for why you've made me. And Jesus answers that for every person in every place. There is not one of you here who does not have a purpose in your life. In verse 21, it says, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Those are some of the greatest instructions that Jesus gives to us. And when we think to that time when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, when all of the people are worshiping him, we recognize that Jesus knows that he is about to go to the cross, and so he allows them to, to worship him. And even though the teachers of the law said, listen, this is, this is getting dangerous, it's getting out of control, Jesus says, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet because if, if they don't praise me, even the rocks will cry out. In your life, you are in need of worship. Worship that flows out of grief, worship that show, flows out of joy, worship that flows out of love, worship that flows out of answered prayer, worship that flows out of the need for prayer. And as we gather on Sunday after Sunday, we come to a place where we say, God, teach me how to worship you. Because worship should cause us to grow. We should be different when we leave than when we came in. More willing to serve, more willing to forgive, more willing to give God the praise and the glory, more willing to get on our hands and knees and pull out those weeds that so easily overtake us, more willing to say, God, when the time comes and you call me to heaven, I am ready for all the people and all the praise and all the surrender when every tribe and every tongue and every nation bows before your throne and calls you the Lord of lords and the King of kings. When we worship, we honor the Father. We celebrate Jesus. And we say, God, you have permission to lead us by the Holy Spirit. As we take a look at that picture one last time of Palm Sunday, I want you to know that same Jesus who entered into Jerusalem wants to enter into your hearts. If you don't know that Jesus loves you, if you don't know that he saves you, there's no better day than today than to say, God, I give you my whole heart. 
I give you permission to pull out every weed. I want to be with you for all eternity. And so I invite you today to celebrate that Jesus, to honor the Father, and to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, lead me step by step wherever it is that you call me to go. Let me pray for us. So God, I thank you for the chance we have to worship you. I thank you every week for this hour that we gather with our brothers and sisters, where we welcome in friends and strangers and aliens, where we seek to be ambassadors for your kingdom, where we meet angels unaware, where we walk with each other through the highs and lows of life, from start to finish. And pray in the midst of it all that you might prepare us to be the kind of worshipers who know you in spirit and in truth. For we give you all the thanks and all the praise. Do it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation. Now revealed in you how Christ, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this.
what a joy it is to worship in spirit and truth with you. Enough willingness to obey wherever the spirit calls us. As we do it together in worship, I want to let you know that the, the creator of all things authorizes you to go share that message. There is no program. There's just us. To let the love that he pours into us and that forgiveness and that hope overflow in us to a world that is broken and lost without him. May we grow in worship that we might share his love with the whole world. As you go this week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. From this day forward, till we'll all meet again. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.